for us right now, it's not blindly follow, make something bigger, double up. It's actually reevaluate and go smaller and, and do multiple smaller projects. Business of Architecture, episode 321. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that doesn't get in the way of you doing your best work more often. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices, the world's only step-by-step -step business training program that shows you how to structure your practice so the complexity of running a business doesn't get in the way of you doing your best work. Discover more by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. Today, we build on last week's interview with architect Katie Chintis about developing real estate projects. If you listen to episode 201 that I did back in 2018, you'll remember I spoke with Alex Gore and Lance Psycho, the founders of the architecture firm F9 Productions based out of Colorado. They talked about a multi-unit mixed use project that they were planning on developing. Well, recently, they sold the last student on that project, and so they reached out to me so they could share the update on how the project turned out. In today's episode, I include the original audio from the interview in 2018, so you don't need to go back and listen to that, so that you can hear the before and after of how they expected the project to go and how it really went. If you've ever wanted to or thought about doing your own development or getting involved in a development, this particular episode is going to be fantastically valuable for you. I also wanted to mention that Alex and Lance are the hosts of the popular Inside the Firm podcast, where they reveal the behind the scenes of how they started and operate their architecture firm. If you aren't subscribed to that podcast, I definitely and highly recommend it. And with that, here is the 2018 interview with architects Alex Gore and Lance Psycho of F9 Productions. Yeah, so we, we have a couple rules. Uh, and then one, I think it was from Seagal, is basically do a project within 15 minutes of, of where you are. When we built the tiny houses, uh, the two newest ones, they were about 40 minutes away. Wasn't too bad, but it was a stretch and it was kind of, there was a tight deadline. So it was really leaning on, on family time. And I just had my baby then. And the baby even went to the hospital for a week. So it, it was just, it was pretty crazy. Um, so we're doing something really close. It's probably five, six minutes away and then do something that we're extremely comfortable with. So we've done a whole bunch of townhomes. So we're going to do a townhome and we're doing, you know, uh, six units on one side, two units on the other side, and then our, then our office. So it might look to maybe some investors and some other people as a, as a big project, but townhomes, we're going to stay in the IRC and you can do single family duplex and townhomes as long as they're structurally independent. So the foundation touches, but everything else is independent in, in the roof. So when you do custom homes, you know, which we also do, you know, two, 3,000, 4,000 square feet, different levels, you know, uh, more richer clients like more advanced things, it's actually pretty complicated. When you do a 20 foot wide by 30 foot, 36 foot deep townhome, that's a box and you know, you do your modern touches on all that and you repeat that eight times, that, that's actually way simpler than, than if you were doing like this, this, this bigger home because once you nail it, you're good to go. Uh, the other thing is that the, the two tiny houses that we did, the new ones, they, if you've seen, you can go to Atlas Tiny House, that's the one from, from a couple years ago, but it has a fold down deck and a fold up awning, which was hard enough the first time. Well, and it was only halfway, so it split the, the, the height of the wall, so the deck was only you know half as tall and the awning was only half as tall, and there was a glass wall behind it. Well, these new clients wanted that, but they wanted the full deck, so the full you know eight to 10 feet to come down and be a deck, and then the full 10 feet to become an awning. Then they wanted that on the other side. And these were going to be used up in the mountains, so the snow load uh, tripled. Yeah. And so the structure, the weight of the structure tripled. So just the feasibility. I mean, we had to like uh, for that project, we had to get a crane and it was, yeah. it was it was crazy. And then they said, oh, on the roof, can you make a sky deck that folds down so that when we're <laughs> moving it, you know, the wind doesn't go. And then we need railings up there. So those all need to fold. Oh, and then we need a detachable stairs that also folds that the railings also fold. And then that times, too. So when I'm looking at this townhome, I'm thinking, oh. This is going to be a piece of cake. There's no, there's obviously, no, there's it won't no be. moving parts. Yeah. Um, 
So, but the the big picture of why we're why we're doing this is uh, this kind of harks back to to college as well. It, um, when when Alex and I were in architecture school, I n- I never understood why um, why architects would not want to at least try doing developments on their own once, so that they a could completely control the the project from a design standpoint. But b if you do that. You know, we're gonna we we are trying to wear three hats with this project. We're the developer, we're the contractor, and we're the architect. So the idea is we're getting paid three times, and that goes back to like learning from Jonathan Segal and what what he does. He's in complete control of the situation. Um, he's you know he's obviously he has a greater risk on the project, but with greater risk becomes greater rewards. Uh, so we do love we do love our our clients right now, but at the end of the day. The more work we can be in control of um, for us is is where we want to be. Yeah, because then we only have to deal with our egos and the city yeah, instead of our I, egos, the client. And, the <laughs> and Alex says I'm hard enough to deal with as it is. So yeah, right. It's uh, <laughs> tough enough with you. So I can tell. Hey, tell yeah. me, <laughs> tell me about the process of buying and acquiring that land. Yeah. So we started <clears throat> we started looking for land last year at the end of last year because we knew. Uh, we knew that we were going to be done with the the second tiny house build. Um, I was also I was also licensed for about a year, and we knew that we would you know for what we wanted to do we should we should probably be licensed because it'd be a multifamily uh, project. So we started looking right next to our office about a, uh, within a half within a half a half a block. That piece of property um, never came to fruition because the the money we would have had to put up was just too much. So. Um, my fiance is our real estate agent and she just kept on the hunt. Another piece of property came up and it was about a third of an acre. And <clears throat> this was our first lesson in cash is king. So at the end of the day, we, we, our goal after this development project is save as much cash as you can so that we can be the cash buyers on the, on whatever next piece of property we want. So we put, we put an offer in on the piece of property that we eventually got. Uh, our offer became the second offer. And the first offer, the person who bought it, they came in with cash, and they, you know, why wouldn't a why wouldn't a seller take a cash deal? They were even lower than our offer. Yeah, they were even low. We actually offered, I, I don't know, ten, twenty thousand more or something like that. There was a there was an escalation clause in the contract. So somehow, over the next six months, <clears throat> maybe it's three or four, something like that. Over the next couple months, uh, the person who bought that piece of property, um, they they put it back on the market. Or they actually didn't put it back on the market. What they did was, the guy who bought it just became physically not able to do whatever the heck he was going to do, and so he wanted to spend his time doing something else. It was gr- what was what was great about that. Him and his real estate, he, he and his real estate agent was his real estate agent got in touch with our real estate agent before they even put it on MLS and said, "Hey, are your guys still interested in the property?" At the price they originally offered, and we said yes. So it was good to be a backup offer. It never got put back up on MLS, and thank God it didn't because I'm not sure we would have got it. Right now, the Denver real estate market is incredibly hot. I think yeah. we're number two in the nation. Number one is Houston. So land prices are just through the roof. And so we got the land for what we want, wanted it for, um, but we did have to take out a loan to do it. Yep. And to go into some of the nuts and bolts about getting lending is that some people think that you really can't get land loans. You got to pay for it all in cash. Um, and the reason is because most banks, your Wells Fargo, your Think Credit, you know, mo- most banks don't really do land loans. So you have to find a specific one that does it. Another reason people don't think that you do land loans is um, just think for residential for doing your own house. A lot of times you don't buy the land because you can't pay for the whole thing. So you're paying, you know, 20 percent and then you have a mortgage on it. Right. Because you have to pay the rest of it. And that even on something like $100,000 might be 500 bucks. Well, if you're just one person, that 500 bucks is is a lot, you know, especially you have college debt and all that. So I had a Lance is like, oh, we got to save up enough for the whole land. I go, no, we can we can get a loan for this. So there's there's a lender here um, and they said, yes, 20, you know, you need 20 percent down. So we had to make sure that we had 20 percent down. Actually, it was 30. Oh, it was thirty. It yep, was 30%. yep, thirty percent down. So save up money for enough money for that, and kind of know what you're looking for. And then we did something. It was a, a balloon payment at the end. So it's a three-year loan, which means 
every month, we're only paying about $1,000, which our firm can handle that, right? Um, and then at the end, we have to pay a balloon payment of, you know, who knows, thousands and thousands of dollars. But hopefully in three years, everything should be sold. So that's fine. So that's how you kind of do the math to make that work is save up 30% and then do the balloon payment at the end. And you have to get lucky and find, you have to have a land, somebody that lends land in the capacity that they are for us where it's, I mean, they're do the three D they do the three year deal because they're lending to developers because they think, okay, it should take you a year to get through all the city. You should build after, build for one year and then you start selling the year after. Um, but it was, uh, we only know of this one entity in Colorado that does this. So, you know, we're, and they're in the town we're in, we're actually north of Denver by about an hour. So, um, I don't know, it's hard, but I, at the end of the day, I think anybody who's thinking about doing this cash is king, even at the lending level. And that probably, you know, that might get overlooked by people. You can't just, we, we, I have a lot of clients that come to me and they say they want to build a new house. And the first thing I ask them now is I start to vet them and say, do you have land purchased? And a lot of them don't. I mean, they just don't. A lot of people do not realize how important it is to have land purchased. Like you can't go to a bank and say, I want to build a new house. Plus, I want to buy the land. They want to see a certain level of skin in the game. So for us, we always knew it was the biggest hurdle is we, if we just get land, I, I think we can make everything else work. It's going to be a uphill battle up a mountain every single day for three years. But if we can just get the land, we're, we're on the right track. Yeah. What's the interest rate you guys are paying on that note? Oh, I think I think it's above ten percent. Yeah, yeah, I think it's around the twelve mark. Yeah, it's pretty steep. It's pretty steep. And explain um, it's, explain to me this lender. So other people who are looking for a lender like this, um, you know, what is what is this person or this entity like so they can find someone like this? Yeah. So it, if you're in Colorado, they're Centennial Lending. Um, but I literally just had to do a Google search for land loans. Um, yeah. And they're sort of like. I would say they're a lending, but they, they don't have, they're not a bank. So they even made us get an account at a local credit union that they work with. So they just, you know, if you were just searching for like bank loans, like that's probably not going to in what, it, you know, whatever town you're in, that might not even hit on the Google search and you might not think that it's in there. So um, search, you know, land loans, ask uh, real estate people too, if they know. And then some of them might say, no, you can't do that. Um, but that's just because it's not done that much. That doesn't mean that you really can't do that. Um, and then when you're looking at land to, to vet which one to, to buy, we've always heard all of your construction costs and all that, how much you think the project's going to cost you. Land should be under 18%. And the other thing you can do is that you can go on your GIS or um, look through your county data and you can see similar projects and then you can look and see how much they bought the land for. So if they bought this huge plot and they're going to do 50 units and then it turned out, oh, it cost them $40,000 per unit per land. We're doing a smaller thing, but it only costs us $30,000. Then you're like, okay, we should be safe um, too because that... I don't know about different areas. You know, California is probably crazy. Depending on where you are in California, too, Valley versus LA versus San Francisco, it's all going to change. So this this lot of land, you guys are are is it? Have you broken ground on the project yet? Where are you at right now in terms of the project? We we're in site. Well, we're not even in site plan review. So we had our pre application meeting, and then uh, the city gave us back all their comments. Then we had to do a neighborhood meeting. And we had to do the neighborhood meeting because we are doing a conditional use on the project. So right what away they want to see. conditional use? Say that again? What, what is triggering the conditional use? Is it the mixed use? It's a commercial. It, the, the, the lot is zoned commercial, but it, it has the ability to be residential so long mixed as it's use. mixed use. Yeah. So uh, it's eight condos. Just to repeat, it's eight condos and then our headquarters, our office building. So that's what throws it in. Um, so, you know, residences aren't typically going to be there. So that's kind of where we're, we're not pushing the envelope, but we're just, that's where we're going with it. So Alex had to present and I took notes. Uh, we had a, we had a community meeting. Um, there's only, there's only three citizens that showed up. They actually really loved the direction of it and everything. So we're on to the next phase. And the next phase is, uh, we are going to get everything ready for our site plan development, right? Yeah. Site plan review. So we're getting all of our civils, um, landscape, all, all, you know, the architecture, you, you basically have to do the majority of the building. The only thing that you don't really have to do is you don't have to show floor plans and you don't have to do, um, all the CD set and the structural set. 
but you can't show the elevation, the heights, what all the materials are, where all the windows are without doing floor plans. So you're literally designing everything and making sure it works. And there's a few other costs that I think everybody else should be aware of too, if they're thinking about going down the development road. Um, so land is one thing, but then there's also out of pocket costs are gonna come. So we had to pay for an environmental, an environmental analysis. Uh, there was a company that had to come out, they had to test the soil, see if it was a brownfield site. Um, one other one that the city, our, we got waived from our local jurisdiction was they wanted us to do Habitat Species Conservation Plan. Yeah, and it is a, <laughs> it is a blank. This is a blank, your typical blank city lot. There's just uh, in the middle of the city. I mean, there's there's no there's nothing on it. There, I don't. Mean, there's a couple trees tops, but they're like uh, they're garbage trees, you know. There's they're not e- there's not even gophers. And and we told them this, and they're like, well, we need someone professional to tell us that there's not even gophers. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's there's that out of pocket cost that might come. And then um, there's a survey. You got to get a survey done. You're actually going to have to get a survey done before you purchase the property, uh, typically, uh, because they need, you know, for in the case of us for a land loan, they wanted to make sure that um, they wanted to make sure that it was a legal piece of property and there was a legal description so they could they could take it to their investors and that we could we could do that we could do the deal. So, go ahead. And make sure because th- this should have been done on our side and we should have known. Um, Make sure it's technically an Alta survey. You can ask your city if you need it, but Alta is is basically what um, the real estate people need to. Not every time when you ask for a survey, they might not do the extra steps to make it that survey. So we're gonna go ha- go back and do it, and it'll just be a little bit extra expense and all that. But just know, like if you are looking at a land, maybe look through this what the city needs, um, and then for the survey, it. I almost think that's the professional standard now, uh, but just make sure you're telling your surveyor that that's what you want. Geotechnical, uh, a geotechnical report is going to be needed. Um, a lot of jurisdictions that we deal with now in Colorado are actually requiring them if you are doing something conditional use or you are doing something uh, or you're trying to add something to the zoning. Like you're not going for a full blown rezoning, but just add something to the zoning because they want the city wants to know what is what you guys you know, let's say you want, you're proposing to put on, um, a big commercial building that's like 10 stories tall, right? They want to know that the soil can support it before they even allow you to get to site plan development. Well, and then I was, I was trying to figure out why they wanted it besides that, because I, I, for site plan review, it shouldn't matter. You know, structures doesn't even come yet. And what they wanted to know also was where the water table was because they wanted to know, because all of your civils are going to be done. They wanted to know if they were going to have to do a, an under drain report that would have cost us a couple thousand dollars. And I was meeting with the city and they said, oh, you have to do an under drain report. And I go, well, the water table, you know, we'll see, but the water table shouldn't be close and you don't have to. Um, if the water table is going to be close to the foundation, because you don't have to worry about what's going to happen there. They said, well, are you doing crawl spaces? So, yeah, we're doing crawl spaces. They're like, well, you're doing something undergrade, you have to do it. And then I go, well, let's bring up the, the city code. And it was habitable, habitable spaces underground. So habitable, okay, that's seven foot, you know, and also it's normally filled in by gypsum. Um, and that's what defines a habitable space. And they're like, oh, yeah, you don't have to do it then. So, But but if you didn't know that, like, that's where you can get stuck with, oh, there's another $2,000 expense yep. that you have to do um, just, be, just because – the codes are so complicated. You know, there's so much to know, and and even though the city should know it, now I'm I'm talking, discussing with the city. They mentioned in our neighborhood meeting that our setbacks need to be changed. He mentioned this rule that for um, every two and a half foot in height, you have to be one foot away from the property. So I'm like, oh wow, that's really going to mess up our project. And I am double checking the code, and that's a residential standard, but we're in a commercial district. So, you know, there's. There's, there's always these plays and it, it could get quite tricky. So I think those are the, um, and then I've had a client recently <clears throat> where we're, they're also a developer and they are kind of doing what we're doing in the sense of uh, the way it's going through, through the city. The typology of the project is different, but the way they've structured their land deal is it's structured like they won't purchase until they know that it's going to be rezoned. That's kind of made everybody edgy um, from the sell on the, on the from the seller side of everything, and rightly so, uh, because there's a lot of money riding on it. But 
some of the extra expenses that they've had to uh, incur are civil engineering, um, civil engineering, more surveys, and then all the architecture and engineering fees. So I think the other idea about architects doing developments um, on their own is that if you if you are giving a lot of work, repeat work to and referring other engineers that you work with constantly, I would hope that there would be um, a, you get you can you could get a better fee from them on your project because there's just this there's just this good 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 boy relate you know good old boy relationship back and forth. Whereas I'm not sure a lot of developers could have that kind of advantage. So, you know, knowing that you're going to have to do all these possible extra, extra expenses up front is one thing. But I think I think there are ways that we that we can that we're going to be able to save money that other people might not be able to. So when not including the land, uh, what's your estimate order of magnitude for the, the money out of pocket that you guys have had to come up with when you look at the geotech reports, when you look at the survey you had to do, some of these other unexpected things that you weren't necessarily planning on? You know, are we, what are we talking in terms of? So this is a, a small project, um, but I think it will be at least thirty to fifty thousand dollars, not including land. Yeah, including all of the engineers once it's once it's said and done. Yeah, it it will match, and this is on. And to put it in perspective, this is on a third of an acre, and I think what would you have? What's your current estimate for construction costs? One point two million. One point two. One point two million. Yeah. So we had to put in about 60K to get the land, and we think we're gonna have to put in another 60K to handle all the other engineers, every all the other stuff that we talked about, not including our fees. I mean, the idea is at the end, we recruit our fees at the very end. Here, some interesting, some interesting things that we've learned from banks so far, and we've only had two meetings with banks so far, um, because we're just taking this step by step, but uh, Jonathan Segal is 100% right in that if you come with a set of approved drawings, they treat it as cash which is incredible. Um, so you can treat that as, a, as an asset. So the, uh, so not only are all the time, like the bank will recognize in a reasonable percentage of the construction cost that you could defer getting paid for those fees in, in lieu of, okay, do you see that as like, this is part of our down payment to get the construction loan? Same thing goes for a developer fee. You can charge a developer fee on top of your architecture fee and defer that cost. And then the same thing for a contractor fee. So as a first time developer, we are hoping <laughs> that all three of those things, which we want to equal 30% if you add them all up, can go towards us not having to have as much cash as somebody else would when we go for the construction loan. Yeah. So if you take uh, 1.2 million, let's just say a million dollars just to be easy. And let's say you have to have 30%, so that's $300,000. Um, and with a development, like a million dollars is actually low. So people are probably talking in like the two million dollars. So you may be, may be like close to half a million dollars in cash. So one of the things that we're going to try to do and we think with that we can do from contractor costs, it can easily be anywhere from 10 to 15 to 17 percent. When we're going to do it, we're going to do it basically at cost. So instead of charging, you know, a specific price or marking up all the materials and having a profit, We'll charge, you know, just 25 bucks to hours per hour just to just to feed. It's it's literally no overhead, no profit in that whatsoever. Um, and then that extra, you know, two hundred three three hundred thousand that the contractor would normally get, we delay that to the end, and that counts as our cash input. So then, you know, that takes care of at least half of of what we have to bring up, bring to the table. So we do think we are going to have to raise. Uh, uh, several, you know, uh, a fair amount of money when it's all said and done, no matter what. Um, so and Enoch, he told me that he'd do that all at a low percentage rate. <laughs> <laughs> he said 5%, Al, you can wow, have the cash. That, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> Good guy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we have started talking to investors. So I think, um, you know, the ideal goal is you eventually are able to wear one more hat and maybe after this first deal to where you're the, also the cash investor. So now you're now you're wearing four hats. And again, you're taking more risk, but then the return comes back fourfold instead of threefold. Yeah, more risk, more return. Yeah. More responsibility, more return. And so you guys have started talking to a couple banks yet, but you haven't actually started the process of getting financing for the project. You're gonna Correct. do that when? Uh, pretty soon here, probably in a couple of weeks, we met with one person that might be a heavy investor. And then honestly, there's there's three to four reputable online um, 
fundraising. And I'm not talking about Kickstarter. I'm talking specifically for real estate um, that that we might also pr- pursue um, for some of that. What's for cool some about of our investors? What's, yeah, what's cool about them is. Um, again, if, like if you're an architect doing this, you have complete control over the marketing, right? So you could spend your own time and your own effort and your own money getting putting the renderings together and selling the project, maybe doing an animation and floor plans and stuff, put it up online. So, you know, that's where it comes. I really think like the sex could sell your, your project, right? Because you're creating these really cool, these really cool spaces and this great, this great architecture. So, you know, I don't know, we're, 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 we're nervously excited to go down that road of how are we going to finance this thing. But like I said, the biggest at the beginning or at the beginning of this conversation was, gosh, the land was the hardest part. I just I just know that was you just had to get get the land secured and it'll happen. I know it'll happen. And another thing is no matter what what you're doing, I don't think you can predict and know how to do everything. So even Elon Musk with, you know, creating rockets, of course, the he's a genius and, and, and we'll figure it out. But <clears throat> there's something to entrepreneurials where it, it's sort of like a, a blind ignorance where you just kind of go in hoping. And as long as you know, and can handle the first step, then you hope you that you can handle the second step and the third step. And then of course with us and, and a lot of people too, is that, okay, this might be a new route, but it's not like it's not anything that we haven't done. It's not like we haven't designed many of these. It's not like we haven't built a lot in, in our past. It's not like we haven't had management skills and all that. It's just, you're combining them in a, in a, in a new route. So know that there will be this fog of war and that's where the term comes from. But that doesn't mean that, you know, war isn't going to happen and that you shouldn't take that leap whatsoever. Yeah. And I think any other architects uh, who, who want to jump into this development scheme, it would behoove them. I would hope that you have good relationships with the developers that you're working with. So it would, be, it would behoove you to not just go out and take that developer out for coffee and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing what you're doing. And just ask them as, uh, as many questions as you can about the business side of things. And I have, we've had no problem um, with getting those meetings and they've had no problem telling us all the information um, at the end of the day and what we want to do. Um, so that even goes down to one of the developers we work with, I said, hey, who sets up your uh, HOAs? And how do you set up your uh, the construction the construction side uh, contracts and everything with, with the buyers of your, of your product? And he goes, oh, I got the perfect lawyer for you. So he's now, so now we're going to meet with his lawyer and he's going to help us set up the HOA, you know, cause condos are high risk. So we want to be, we want to have make sure everything's secured in that way. But, um, I don't know, it just kind of goes back to, I don't think, I don't think it ever hurts to ask any, anybody you're working with those kind of questions. And then, and then the final thing about, you know, learning from other developers is if you're working with them, you already know the whole process. You you should at that point know the whole process of what it's going to take to get through the city, especially if you're the architect and you're the umbrella of everybody else is underneath you. You know, all the other engineers and stuff have been hired. You've seen exactly what the heck the city's going to ask um, for better or for worse and how you can fight back about some things and say, hey, do we really have to do we really have to do this environmental uh, this habitat thing? No, not really. OK, good. Because of previous experiences on other projects where the other developers have try to, you know, reduce those uh, things from the city. Yeah. And then also, um, I think if you met developers, I'm sure they're smarter, th- you know, all that. But I don't think a lot of architects think that these developers are out of their league. I don't think this is a intellectual knowledge based thing where it, it, where you can't handle because I think our society is an action based society. It's not only an intellect based society. So you need to point your actions in that direction and then just reduce and close that feedback loop. Yeah. So know the client and, and, and the faster that you can close that feedback loop and just keep keep iterating on that, especially for the things that you don't know, um, people, especially if you've been a good architect helping helping other people they'll give you that information. They'll tell you about fees. They'll tell you about whatever. So, so just know that I, I really think it's action orientation and, and getting that. Feedback and those developers, closer. those developers might even want to be investors in your project. That's the other thing is if you are doing, if, if they already believe is there, they've already hired you and believe as you believe in you as the architect that you're going to help them create products that they can sell for profit. So if you're, if you're taking that approach with your project, 
I, 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 I would get, I would, I would venture to guess that some of them would potentially even want to be investors on the capital side. Of and, and some of ours are on the south side of Denver, where we're on the north side of Denver. And if you're, it's a big enough city where that's an hour and a half away. There's no way where <laughs> I'm never doing anything down there. You're never doing anything up here. So it's not, you're not really competing. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of investors, what kind of deal are you looking at to close that gap in the funding that you're going to need? Because you're going to need some extra cash for this deal. Uh, have you started talking to investors? And if so, what kind of terms are you guys thinking is going to work to make that close that gap? So there's two different ways that you can approach it. You can get a hard money lender where that's all they're doing. They're just giving you money and they want within a year, they want to return on that or maybe even a two year on a bigger project. And then there's a partner. The partner um, is where we're trying to avoid because the hard money lender, we're hopefully that we can give terms at around 18% of whatever cash you get in. So you give us the cash, you sit back, you're going to beat the stock market. Um, here you go. Easy, easy money. Um, the partners will probably want a percentage of the, of the profit. Um, and if you can only get money that way, that's all you, what you can do, but they can cut into that profit. I've heard numbers up to 50%, 30%, you know, that's huge. And especially when, if you're doing it our way where you're carrying all these hats and you're leaving the profit, you know, for later, just to make sure like this is foolproof, even if the market drops, your money is not at risk. And even with the hard money lender, what basically happens is that the hard money comes out first. So let's say Enoch, you gave a hundred and we put in a hundred. Okay, so that comes out first, no matter what. And then the 18% comes out um, after that. So everyone gets their actual dollars back. You know, um, to quote Shark Tank, you don't want your money soldiers to die. So at least you're guaranteeing that that comes back. So there you have it. That's the end of the relevant part of my interview with Alex and Lance that I did back in 2018. So let's move on to the most recent interview about how the project turned out. Hello, Lance and Al. Welcome to the business of architecture. Should I say welcome back? Well, hey, thanks for having us. It's it's always great to see you and, and talk to your listeners. We had you guys on over a year ago, and one of the big topics of discussion was the project you all were working on. And I'm so glad you reached out. You said, hey, Enoch, we've, we've wrapped that up. You'll give us an update on where that's at right now. But give our listeners a background on what that project was all about. And let's focus the, the time we have together here talking about that and really unraveling the stories so that some of our listeners who maybe want to develop their own projects can get started off on the right foot, maybe spark their imagination. Yeah, so w w I'm glad we did reach out back to you because when you asked us, when we had us on, I think over 18 months ago now, it was at the very beginning of our project, we couldn't answer some fundamental questions of yours because we hadn't actually got through financing. We were still working through that. And that's obviously without financing, you can't you can't build a project. Uh, so that's one of the biggest reasons why I reached out back to uh, reach out back to you to kind of unpeel that onion a little bit more. And Al, Al has some numbers that he'll he'll share with us. Um, so the project overall is it was a a nine unit development, a triplex and a sixplex. And it was a, a little tiny piece of property that we bought uh, in 2017. It was uh, about it was 0.29 of an acre. So very small urban infill. All the neighbors already built around us. And we were subject to the ramifications of what they what they did. We were also up against the clock um, because, you know, if, you, if anybody listens to our podcast inside the firm, I've been projecting that we will hit a downturn in 2020 and here we are. So we knew we had to get it off the ground and, and all of that. And Alex can kind of speak a little bit more about sort of what it what this project was as far as a culmination of all of our experiences. Yeah. So uh, our firm that we started about 10 years ago, this is kind of a, a full circle that we're doing here on, on your firm, uh, on your podcast. Uh, because we started very small and we started in residential and then eventually we got into multifamily. Um, and then from that multifamily, we've done some side projects that has helped leapfrog us into this development. So Lance has always been a builder since he could probably swing a hammer. And uh, I, I've been I've done some building, too. <clears throat> so one of the one things that we did was uh, we made a tiny house and that tiny house got an HGTV. And then after that, a Fortune 500 company saw. Us, so we made two huger tiny houses that were transforming and then we took the profits from that and we bought the land. So we had this sidetrack of building that gave us some money and then also we had all the lessons we learned from doing all the multifamily projects in Denver. And then when and we how bought much did it, you spend on that land, Al? We bought we down payment was 60k and the whole land was 180k. Um so 
all those lessons and some of them you know are hard lessons and some of them are just practical lessons um, such as uh, don't step your foundation unless you have to right do everything in two foot increments simplify the structure um, get your architectural elements by um, not not moving the structure but maybe just doing some easy to create pop-outs um, and so that modern design kind of kind of helped us so we we internally call this project mark two because just like cameras in their first development is called mark one and then all the improvements come in mark two so we kind of try to take all those lessons and then we we fooled ourselves in thinking that all those lessons would make it super easy we ended up learning a bunch more lessons uh but it did help if we didn't have all that background um, it probably would have been even harder than it was Well, let's walk us through that. What were some of the biggest challenges in the project that came up? Boy, do you want me to go first or you? Al, so I think one thing, to, one critical part to talk about is that I was the main uh, person on the site for maybe, I don't know, five or six months until Alex Alex came in at the end and kind of tied, you know, tied everything up at the end, um, or cinched everything up. That's That's a better word. So, you know, we, we and one of our biggest lessons, I think, was learning that we should have both been on site from the beginning and we should have made it so that because for this large of a project, it, uh, I think the construction budget um, ended up being about two point five million. And so when you have two buildings like that, I think it, it also kind of played to this idea that there's two there's two heads of our firm. Therefore, one person should have been in charge of one building or the other, or at least we should have split things up a little bit more. And. Alex, Alex's, you know, big thing too was, I think, and I agree with him, is that we we did too much self-performing. But the problem with that was, we had to do a lot of self-performing in order to make the budget work, because we were knew we were up against the clock in order to finish the thing before there was this now recession that we're looking at, and and make sure we're not holding a you know a multi-million dollar bag. And yeah, and we also had to self-perform because they wouldn't give us enough money to complete the project. So we had to basically do work, for, have our firm or Lance do work so that we could actually complete it. And going back to that lesson, well, when I got on the job site, you know, because I was mainly running F9 and then I had to come onto the job site. And at first I actually really liked it because Lance was actually doing a lot of the physical labor, running around getting stuff. And then he was also ordering materials and stuff like that. But every morning there's, uh, at least five, sometimes seven trades coming in, asking questions, don't know what to do, dropping stuff off. And I left for, we finally brought basically the whole firm out. And I left for one morning to go teach at school. And I said, I said to one of our guys, okay, you stand, just stand in the middle of the site and just answer questions. That's all. Like, don't do any work whatsoever. And he comes back and he's like, Alex, you wouldn't believe it. Like everyone was asking questions. It was the most craziest thing for like two hours straight. There was this guy, this guy, the plumber was here. You know, just named all this stuff. And I was giggling inside. Like, that is every morning. While you guys are off <laughs> doing your stuff like that, the, the most crazy thing that's ever happened to them is literally every morning. And it felt like gambling to me because we would have a problem where um, we didn't lay our sewer at the right level, right? So what do we do to that? Do we do a lift station? Do we dig everything back up? Blah, blah, blah. We're literally gambling $20,000 like in a half hour calling out the engineer, calling over the city. So it's like, today, did I lose $20,000 or did I make up $20,000 or did I, you know, maintain $20,000? Like those were the decisions happening like on, on a daily basis. And that leads to Lance, Lance's lesson and what we're trying to do now in this recession, right? So this reception, recession, if you can call it that, is an opportunity and also a kick in the butt. Um, it's an opportunity, like you said, maybe it was before the call when you said, maybe we can refinance, relook at things, right? But a kick in the butt because firms get started in a recession. We got started in a recession and that's why it's full circle. So at first, kind of like your email, you said, the email that you sent out to your whole listeners is, I was feeling kind of down. And then after that, I decided that I was gonna grow, right? We went through the same thing and that's why we read the email on, on our podcast. And we said, okay, we have roots. Now we need to strengthen all of these roots. And what we're doing is teaching our guys sales, expanding our online presence, doing all these things. So now 
if the next thing happens where let's say Lance is out doing some idea or I'm doing some crazy idea and then I say, okay, Lance, you need to stop running the firm and you need to come help me. Well, then we have our guys at that next level so that that can happen more easily rather than us being um, too stressed or, or overworked, right? To be able to put enough people on the task that it requires. Brilliant. So you're spending time to actually train your people while the ship is docked at harbor, training all the sailors. Absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I just sent, and I don't even think Alex has had a time to read the email that I just sent out maybe a half hour ago. I forwarded him an email that I had composed to um, one of one of our project managers. And that is, we were even, you know, there's two, there's two kinds of business that we're going to try to go after or places of one place to advertise and then another place to go after business. And so it was very specific, and I, I'm actually one of his challenges is I gave him an I gave him an example of an ad copy that I like, and I said, but I want you to come up with four different ones for in four, for four unique different client clients in different areas, and then let's work together, and I'll show you how to post them, I'll show you how to go after that business, and um, we're just not afraid to peel back that onion and give them a little bit more responsibility. You know, at the end of the day, if we can reward people for that, why not? Why would we? Why would we hold back with that? And then the other one too is, is actually government work. I, I never thought we'd, we've been, we've talked about it for about a decade, but I think if you look at the last recession, that was one of the things that did come out of it is that there was um, a lot of infrastructure spending. Even, even President Trump has talked about that before all of this stuff happened is that he was a big infrastructure guy and was gonna do all these spending things. So just having all of those irons in the fire, I don't think can hurt. I think if you're in a position like we are where you're not, you're not panicking, you can actually plan a little bit. Or if you can calm yourself down, like we all kind of did, we all had a little panic and our little sad sad story and then came and reconvened, that, that's really what you gotta do. And to speak a little bit more about strengthening the roots, everybody can do this. You know, my my initial idea to Al when I was a couple of days last week was, well, should we start, an, <laughs> should we start another business? And he's like, no. <laughs> Remember how long it took to make F9 uh, successful, profitable, well-known, and it took, a ten, it took 10 years. And so, you know, then his idea is, what if we just strengthen all of these roots? So we had a big uh, session, just he and I at the, at the mezzanine table, planned everything out as far as identifying the different roots, the podcast, the construction firm, the architecture firm, um, the online sales we do with Rabbit Rocket Ship. How can we, and then even, and even some ideas about maybe we do a little business course or something like that, that, that could be helpful for people. How do you just strengthen those roots? So other people who are listening, I would encourage you to do the same thing. And I've said this on other, other shows too, is that if you're an architect right now and you've ever thought about taking the G, putting the GC hat on, maybe now's the time. Maybe now is the time for you to take that class C test, which is just residential uh, level of that. Everybody, Just about everybody can get that. And maybe it's time for you to take that leap and present yourself to clients and say, hey, I would love to, I would love to you know, build your project, even if it's just a little addition, because if, if they have cash that they have reserved for this or they already have their loan approved, that's shovel ready, cash ready you know, money to get you to help extend your longevity through that. Nick Renard from Dig Architecture, um, that's one of his you know, nuggets of wisdom I think he bestowed on me. When it was that day that you stopped by with the at the AIA conference uh, in uh, in in um, Las Vegas this last summer, he and I were talking about that. Like, how do you you should be looking at ways to extend your longevity so you can weather this storm because it is it's going to be temporary. It's just like the last one. We don't know how long it's going to be, but it's not forever. There's no way. Yep. And then if, if we want to dive further, um, I think that's a great maybe first step is to to build something that you've already designed. And it can be small or it can be a house, right? Um, but since we did start talking about Mark II, if you were gonna develop, I do have some numbers and some uh, maybe ways that we even could have done better uh, on that on getting financing. So if you're gonna get a bank loan, it, it's gonna be about a three to 5% interest uh, on that loan. The hard thing about that though is that it's pretty strict on a 17, 75% loan to value or loan to cost, whatever is lower, right? They wanna reduce their risk. They also have things like, they wanna make sure you have enough liquidity. So if you don't have enough liquidity, you might need another guarantor, right? So for example, let's just use easy numbers. If you wanna uh, get a loan for a million dollars at 4%, you're, 
you would have to pay back one million and then forty thousand dollars to get that. That's the way you want to go. If you don't have the bank's requirements or can't meet that seventy-five percent, then you might need to go pure private, and then we'll talk about a hybrid approach. So pure private would be anywhere from twelve to eighteen percent, right? So, but what's great about them? It was 65% loan to value, and that's about it. I mean, we, we got that loan within a week, and that's the way that we we had to go. Um, and it was so simple. We were working with banks for probably three, four months, and then I got a random email, followed up with them on a Monday, and then the next Monday we had money in the bank, and Lance was out 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 building. Um, it was it was that quick. I even think like you're out there on Sunday for some reason doing something. So we had to go with the private loan and those rates are different. So they're from 12 to 18%. And um, so in, in in that scenario, on a million dollars, you'd be paying $1,160,000, right? So can you, can you walk me through, before we jump into that, can you walk me through why didn't the bank loan go through and how much money were you trying to get together to make, be able to make that? Because it seems like 75 loan to value, it was less money you had to come up with, but there was something else happening there. Why Why didn't that work out? Basically, we needed 200 to about $200,000 in cash that we physically did not have because we put 60K in the land. We were also running our firm. We probably had, you know, 80K or something like that, but yeah. we just didn't have the 200. There was no way to get the 200. And mind you that we are very cognizant that we needed to get this started because we projected maybe eight months build. It was a year build and that was in January and now we're in March and here's the recession, right? Or even if this isn't the recession, it's not a good time to have things not complete, right? So that difference, and I just did an average of, you know, 16%, that's a $120,000 difference right there. And if you're talking 2 million or 3 million or more, you know, that's actually adds up pretty quickly. So the hybrid scenario, if you can, so let's say that the bank would give you $750,000, right? That's, you have to pay back $780,000. So it's $30,000 in entrance. You get a private loan for $250,000 at 16% and you're paying $40,000 for that. So total is $70,000, but that's a savings of $50,000, right? So for us, it could have saved us $125,000, which makes it, just think about that in, in uh, the idea of your kids' college funds, right? You could fund a bunch of kids' college funds with that money. Um, so the the private money is that 12 to 18 percent is only on what they they you know give you. Now, if they have to become a guarantor or two, you might have to give them a couple points more. But still, you can see even if you had to give them twenty thousand dollars more or something like that, you're still making out. Um, and that's what we didn't do, but wish that we we could have done. Which is what was the hybrid approach? Yeah, but this yeah, and, and just to to actually bring it down to brass tacks about the timing of everything, like Alex just mentioned, is we sold our last unit on March for, March fourth, twenty twenty, and the stock market was at twenty six thousand seven hundred eighty four points, and then it just went into a free fall, and that that was literally the high point after a little dip. Like if you go look at the charts, so I just can't tell you like how. The, t the timing was, I mean, it was like a miracle in every single kind of way. So we really just had to move forward at the end of the day um, and, and get this done because, you know, we actually probably would have sold that unit just December, right? But then one of, one of it flooded. Uh, so that's a whole different story, which uh, went for another hardship. But knowing that that those kind of things can happen like a flood, I think it's important for everybody to know that that time is of the essence even more, especially if you're, end, if you're at the end of a business cycle, right? So maybe two years from now, we pull out of this and we're at the beginning of a business cycle. You could take your, I think you could take your time a little bit more with a, with a, with a traditional bank loan. Um, then, then what we had to do, which was just, we need to get this off the ground. Yep. Okay. And if you don't now, mind, let me unpack this because if, if, if I'm having difficulty following this, my listeners might as well. Now you mentioned the flood. Was this a natural disaster? Or was this something like a pipe broke? So it was a pipe broken. I think we have a little bit of time to go into it. Lance is normally up early and so am I. And he starts texting me at, at four in the morning, which is with some jokes, which is totally normal, right? And then he gives me a phone call 
And I, I text him back. I'm like, you can't call me at four in the morning. Like, <laughs> you can text, but not call. Like my kids are sleeping, stuff like that. And he goes, the um, the sprinklers went off. So, I, I think the sprinklers went off. Yep. To be more specific. So yeah, I got to the job site, and this is when Alex, Alex and I were both on the job site, um, full time basically. And you know, I was like, oh, I'm gonna, for, I'm gonna get up super early today, 4 a.m. Again, we're self-performing stuff, and my self-perform that day was getting all the concrete slabs ready for an epoxy. And I get out of my truck, and I hear a beep, 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 beep. And I'm like, what the heck? This sounds exactly like the beep that I heard in our unit when the painter was spraying and there was just so much humidity in the air that it made the fire alarm squawk because we had to sprinkler all these buildings. Mm. So I'm like, oh, maybe it's just a malfunction. You know, it takes time to iron out all these things in new buildings. And so I'll go check it out. So I went and checked. I went to the unit that uh, was making this sound, open up the door. And you talk about cutting a grown man down to his knees. It was absolutely that, um, you know, that opened the door and it was just a, it was a rainforest in this in this townhome dripping, dripping every, from the ceilings and everywhere. That, and that's when I called Alex. Well, then I then I called Alex and he he picked up this time <laughs> <laughs> because I because I texted him before and I said, uh, you know, the I think the sprinklers went off and Alex and I have this this disdain for how much we sprinkler buildings anyway so it was kind of like a trigger word for us right and so uh he called you know called the fire department called the fire department alex lives about a half hour out of town um so by the time he gets there it's me and the fire uh, the fire folks walking through the unit trying to identify what is going on exactly and there, there was no fire and so finally alex gets there none of the heads were broke yeah none of the heads were broke it was just it was just the the sound yep. of, of the fire alarms. So I arrive and and, the, and we couldn't find it. And they had this little machine that would basically measure the temperature in different areas. So eventually I go, where's the hottest part? And it was right above the kitchen. And Lance immediately goes in his head like, oh, I must have drilled through the cabinets into something. Like he messed up. Because again, I self-performed all of the kitchen cabinetry. Yep. <laughs> and... But then for some reason, I'm like, let's go upstairs. So we go upstairs and we're in the master. I'm just with one of the fire guys. And I said, show me where the hottest part is right here. And it's behind the sink. So I open the cabinet under the sink and there's just a gash in the drywall and a fitting, one fitting broke loose, the hot water. And it was a hot, it was a tankless hot water heater. Yep. So for who knows, four or five hours, it was just spraying hot water out and then getting into all the floors and then just soaking the hallway down, the whole way down. And that's why it felt so hot. That's why Lance thought it was a fire. That's why I thought it was a fire yeah. too, because it, it was amazingly warm in there. So we thought maybe something was burning on the inside. And these developments, what's so crazy about this is not only is that devastating, not only is the timeline devastating, but the margins, you don't make anything until everyone else gets their money you, back. You truly eat last. If you're a business owner, you're always eating last, but with a development, I mean, it's, I just can't explain, uh, well, three years. I mean, it took three years before money returned to us, almost yeah. to the day. It was, it, again, totally eerie, because I got a Facebook memory come up about when we purchased the land, and it was almost to the day, three years previous to that. So this this giant risk that these developers take, um, I don't know, I just hope more people thank developers for risking their livelihoods. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and and now luckily, I mean, we're sitting in our new office. Um, it's great. We have a two and a half. We have two story space here. We have everyone, you know, upstairs. We have a sky deck. Uh, but it was, if we ever make it sound easy, that's only because we're pretending to be cool. Um, because <laughs> it was not easy, and that's why we're we're trying to give some of this back. Is because it's always it's already stressful enough being an architect. Stressful enough being an architect having a family. Stressful enough being an architect, being a contractor, and a developer. So if we can if we can help the profession out, um, I think that bodes wed well for all of us. Because one of the things we like to talk about is more responsibility, more re reward. But if you take on more responsibility too, you you get to see all the problems that other people are dealing with, and it and it helps the perception of our whole profession, so that. When we do ask for more fees, we can be more confident when we um, or no, you know, more confident because we know what we're doing um, and then offer that 
essentially it all goes back to the client, that value that we can offer to the, to the client. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, what, what a powerful reframe. I can only imagine when that water line burst and you went in there and it's dripping down like a rainforest. I mean, geez, that must have been disappointing after getting up early, going in there, really working so hard to make that. So what did you guys do? You had to pull out all the drywall, ripped up the flooring, pull out the insulation. I mean, gut the place. What what ended up happening? We had to deal with insurance. Um, the, 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 there's a couple, you know, there's a silver lining to everything, right? I, I believe tragedies happen for a reason. The rise, if you don't believe that, then you believe that the world is pure chaos and it's not. It's a balance between order and chaos. So the plumber owned it that was that was pretty huge you know they they without question said yep this is on us and immediately had serve pro out there and then immediately started the insurance claim and so we worked through all of that and did end up you know we, we, the insurance claim went fairly quick i would say for an insurance claim it was only about a, about a month before we finally got you know a settlement and then people were working again and so that we got the settlement done right around Christmas, right a little bit before Christmas. And then I had subs already lined up again, different subs this time for different trades. It was just kind of a, the thing I think we needed to do and pivot to with that last um, unit just to make sure we got it done against, again, up against the clock. And so we, were, we managed to get it done within three months. We were projecting six months. And then like we said early, that March 4th date is when the D-Day was and we sold it and then everything kind of kind of went southward. And it worked out well, too, because the buyer of that unit was a unit right next to it. So they were an investor that liked that unit, the cash investor, and then they knew what was happening because we let everyone know. Um, and we said we were going to put it back on, on the market. And back then, the market was looking great. Um, and they said, oh, no, we'll, we'll buy it. Uh, so it, we were very fortunate in that regard. Insanely fortunate. And then the other silver linings were then So then finally cash did come back to Alex and I and the entire firm. And so we were able to give out uh, for the first time ever in 10 years, a bonus at the beginning of year of the year that was promised to all of our, all of our um, employees and workers. We, we did end up giving a, a Christmas bonus like we always do. But then this extra one, again, the timing was like, Oh, great. So now we gave them fairly substantial bonuses and you know, then everything started tanking. We're like, make sure you save your money. <laughs> so, so it did work out. And, and the other thing I think it did too is uh, it made us, we, the trajectory of us to do this development, I think it was necessary. I think we had to do it in our, in our lives. Like Alex and I will try everything at least once professionally for sure. And so it, it, we got it out of our system and our conclusion after that was that after then taking a look and reassessing is like, would we do another one? There's a piece of property that's right to the south of our this development that we're sitting in right now, our office building. The, the owner was going to give us a sweet deal. It was going to be a uh, sort of owner owner finance thing. He was going to defer all the interest even and, and the payments until the end, like kind of an incredible thing. And the we came to the conclusion, like for us, where we're at in Colorado, because it takes three years to get a development done, maybe even longer with a bureaucracy. And now there's, since we started developing too, there's an, uh, an inclusionary zoning ordinance that, that came online, which is just a whole nother can of worms and, and takes out of profit margins and everything. It doesn't make any sense for us to develop anytime soon. So when we pivoted though, and we said, why don't we just become, why don't we try to become the best builders we can become? And so I'm currently GCing a, it's a barn dominium in the middle of 10 acres in Boulder County. It's a, I'm so glad we, we pivoted to this because the owner is a cat, he's cash funded. So there's no banks, you know, it's a secure line of income that's coming in, um, especially if architecture dips. We've already, you know, our firm will actually be doing, our crew will be doing the roofing, the interior doors, a lot of the interior finished carpentry, even epoxying the slabs again and stuff like that. So to keep, to keep people busy and working until we come out of the dip, I think I'm thankful for. And Alex is Alex is lining up a custom house right now in town too. And, and he and one of his project managers, they're going to take that on. But our idea is just to become, we, we got through this development. Okay, now how can we just, how can we strengthen this construction route that, that was born out of, out of this project? Because I wouldn't even have been able to go out, we wouldn't have been able to go after this barn, which is, it is a it is a commercial structure, so I had to have a Class B license. I had to have a, had to have a Class B license to do the development. It's all serendipitous and, and seems like it, it need it needed to happen in this way. So 
you know, for all the struggles, there's a lot of silver linings, I think. And you just got to look positive, uh, look towards positive and make those positives uh, even better. And to dive deeper on on why we pivot, because I think our natural step step and what a lot of people would assume is that we thought we were going to double up. We we're going to do something twice as big. Right. That was going to be our next step. We keep doing something twice as big or maybe not twice as big, but in that general area. And we pause because this might not be true in your area, but it could be is that what we found with a lot of other developers, too, is that construction costs keep rising, but there but there is a ceiling on what you can get. So the margins were just too small. So we could do four small projects and get the same reward as doing an eight plex or a nine plex. And then the second part that we like to hit on with our own firm is shorten that feedback loop and tighten it up so that you can make quicker decisions. But that also goes to, if you're doing one of these bigger projects that takes three, four years, that's not a quick feedback loop, where a house is a, is a quicker feedback loop. Now, who knows, maybe in a year, two years, three years, we might do a bigger project. But for us right now, it's not blindly follow, make something bigger, double up. It's actually reevaluate and go smaller and, and do multiple smaller projects. Amazing, makes a lot of sense. Can we take a look at the numbers here as we wrap up? Just just let's look at what happened with this project. Make sure I have it right. Okay. So you guys had 60K down to get the land, and the land had a value of 180K. Now you went shopping for a bank loan, and they were looking for $200,000, $220,000 for you guys to put into the project to fund the beginning of construction. Now, you guys had already done all the design and all the, did you guys pay for the engineering and everything? Out of pocket, yep. Paid for that out of pocket, yep. Okay. So now you paid for that out of pocket, so you've sunk some additional money in. You You said you have about 80K potentially sitting here that you can invest in the project. The bank is wanting 220, and so this is just not working out you start looking for private funding. What was the access or the path to find these private, this private money? So I knew about a couple of them, but again, randomly someone called me on a Monday and said, are you looking for private financing? And you maybe have gotten these emails. If you sign up for anything, you know, your email goes <laughs> to everyone. And I said, yes, I am. And then they called me and it realized that they were specifically looking for these type of these type of projects, they they fund these type of projects. Um, so I would say they found me, but um, now we know of some some other ones. Once I, you once you take out one multi million dollar loan, you just <laughs> they're like, do you want to take out more? I mean, it's just been nonstop. They're lining up. It's, it's yes. flattering because we did. You know, the other silver line too that I didn't bring up is we paid off we paid off a ton of debt. Um, with that, like I, I been paid off, uh, you know, some credit card debt that I'd racked up just over the three year period of like skimping and saving to try to get this off the ground, stuff like that. And so, so and then we when, have when you guys cashed out of the project at the end here, when you sold the last unit, you're able to pay down a bunch of your existing debt. Is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And then we, and then we actually, we, we, we could have, uh, we could have just kept our building basically title title, you know, f free of any debt, but we, 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 we did sort of did a reverse mortgage and that's how we got paid for it. And so getting a commercial, you know, having a commercial mortgage plus a personal mortgage, we look like all stars as far as credit goes, but it, but uh, that's not a brag. That's a, oh no, now they just think I want to take up more multi-million dollar loans and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so the, going back to, so you're getting the financing now, you get this person calls, how much money do you have to put in the project? Do you have to be a guarantor, guarantor, guarantor of the loan? Any collateral has to be put in the deal. What was that deal? Right. So I thought all of everything you just said was going to happen. So I thought it was going to be another month long process of all this stuff. And basically what they said is we're going to, um, what's the, uh, an evaluation estimate? What is the word I'm looking for? Um, when, not an, an audit, appraisal. An appraisal. An thank appraisal. you. We're gonna have an appraisal come out and we will loan you. We need to make sure that that you're a contractor, that you own this much of the land. The appraisal, whatever that comes in, we'll give you 65%. That's it. That was it. That was it. There was none, none of these other hoops that took us three, four months with the banks that eventually didn't go through anyways. The other thing too is you are able to build, you're able to entice everybody to build faster, whether that happens or not. It all depends on your subs. 
but the cash when you do a draw request with a uh, with one of, with these private money, I mean, sometimes it's next day, or not next day. Sometimes it's same day. Sometimes if you put your fund, if you do a draw request in the morning, if an inspector gets out there by, let's say I put it in at 8 a.m., uh, the deadline for the West Coast where the money was coming from was like 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific. If they had an inspector come out before then, submit the documents, and they were in before the deadline, we'd be funded by like 3 or 4 p.m. cutting people checks. Um, it kind of worked, it kind of didn't, but I would at least throw that tidbit out there that I think could get overlooked is that the, the money is faster. So depending on if you had the right subs that had their crap together and would move quicker or like move you up in the process, you know, from other clients, uh, it is a possibility. Now walk me through the hybrid loan scenario since we just talked about taking out this loan. Were you suggesting that you would get a bank loan for a portion of the right. construction loan? So how it, it's different than a home financing, and this is maybe what people don't understand, and maybe probably what we didn't understand, is that let's say I was buying a house, um, and they wanted me to have 20% down. They would be very concerned if that 20% came from my parents or something like that. With commercial loan, it doesn't matter. So in this scenario, let's say we needed $220,000. We would call Enoch up and said, hey, we have this project. You could literally give us $220,000 we could put in our bank account show the, the 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 bank and they'd say yes that's enough cash we don't care if it was enoch or if it was bob you know it it literally does not matter where in the private it, it does matter so then it would just be a deal between us you know what you wanted um and and i mean like it literally could be you or it could be one of these private institutions that do this right um because you might not know someone that just wants to give you $200,000, but it, it definitely could just be just a random person that, not random, but someone that you know, or it could be one of these financing people that kind of split it up, essentially. Some with them, some with the bank. Great. So are you suggesting the hybrid loan approach would be to borrow the hard money or the private money would be the, the down payment? So you just limit it to $220,000, whatever, to get the project funded through the bank and then the lion's share of the money is coming from the bank. Is that what you mean by the hybrid approach? Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. Got it. Okay. So you guys were in, so cash into the deal at the beginning, what did you guys end up putting in all told? If you add up all the engineers and all that, about 120k. And does that include the 60k down for the land? Yes. Okay. Wow, pretty lean. So 120k in. Now you have your line of funding. You're like, let's get this started. So you have the drawings approved and everything. You start building, like you said. And how long does it take? Does it take the the construction time? Yeah, construction. Yep, construction took about one year, and it took a year and a half to go through the city and all that. Um, California, Colorado, I'm sure a lot of places are like that, but it took a while. They are, yeah. So approvals, design time approvals, building was about three years total, right? A year of that was building, so two years was the design and the approvals. Yep. Is that about, yep, about that, right that, on the timeline? And then the total amount of the loan that you guys got to build the project was what? 2.412. That's probably a number you saw pretty often. You have that in your mind. 2.412. Okay, 2.412 million. And how much did you guys, again, now sorry if I've already asked this question, but how much did you guys have to put down to get that funded? Was that the 120? Was that included in the 120? Yes. Okay. So 120, you guys now have the, the cash is flowing, you're building the project, it takes a year. And then tell us about the marketing and the selling of this. I mean, you guys are guys that are a little bit more astute in terms of marketing and selling, you have to sell these units. My wife my wife was a, was a realtor. So uh, that, that was interesting um, to, for everybody. <laughs> so, you know, the work for me, Work just couldn't stop. I mean, you know, I'd come home and I'd be like, oh, man, I wish we weren't talking about business, but here we are. Uh, but she did a great job. Uh, for her, it was a learning experience. For us, it was a learning experience. I think the biggest thing was she was selling thin, she was selling made up, she was selling air. I mean, she really was. The first pro the first unit that went under contract, there were two walls that went up, and that was it. She walked them out on the slab uh, as soon as the slab was poured on one of the little buildings. And then the next day we 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 framed up you know two walls on the on the first level of the garage, and then um, 
Then there were some concessions that happened all the way throughout the process that I think, again, this timeline and this crunch, if you can position yourself better than we did, we just, again, we just had to get, I think we just had to get this out of our system. It's out of our system now. But let's say in two years we were going to build it again. Is it, I would do, I think, be a little, be very firm and principled about what are we going to concede with every buyer? The idea was we weren't going to do any custom stuff. But at the end of the day, we had to do some custom stuff. So we had to, okay, you guys want an extra pantry in your kitchen plus two extra cabinets and a countertop. What's that going to cost? Some people want to reconfigure this lower floor to have like a shower instead of just a toilet and a sink. Things like that, we conceded. And just to get the sale done. Um, it worked out in the end, but I but that probably added, you know, a week here and a week there. And then you add it up over nine units and you're kind of, you know, extending further, which we would initially want to have a nine month build. All the other contractors, developers that we've done projects like this on said, yeah, this should be an eight to nine month build. And I think that probably hurt us a little bit. Uh, so by the we but we did have them all under contract, ready to go uh, before we had the certif certificate of occupancy. And then I think the, the other thing is that we, another painful lesson was, if I'm if I'm ever gonna build like this again, it would be, I would give people, I don't know why we didn't do this because we do this with everything else, is give people a worst case scenario of, we think it's gonna take nine months, but we're not gonna tell them that. It's gonna take a year. You're not gonna be able to right. move, into your, move into your condo or your townhome or your house or whatever for a year. On a, on a this is, and I, I wanna make it clear that on a, um, speculative project that's i think that should be that will be our approach anyway is really telling them the worst case scenario and then you look like the good guy when you move things up a week two weeks three weeks a month whatever if it's a custom build like we're doing now we actually have a gantt chart and it's going pretty well i mean it's just one building so much so much easier of a, of a monster to try to deal with in corral every day than you know nine units in a two and a half million dollar development and we were able to make fly-throughs. Uh, so we made a 3D fly-through of everything, and that helped sales. But then in the end, we need to find a better way to set the client up with things might change. So meaning, hey, in a rendering eight months before it's done, that's not necessarily what it's going to work out to be. And sometimes the clients would get very s sticky about that, you know. Oh, there was supposed to be a pocket door here, but in the field it didn't work, so we don't have a pocket door, right? That and these sticking points can be hectic, can be chaotic because not only are they upset, but you're trying to build this project, so you don't want to deal with this extra kind of things going on. We've even had something where, um, so I think it was a learning process for everyone. Our agent told them something that wasn't like, oh, we weren't ever going to do that, and. She said, well, I told them that, so now it needs to be done. And I couldn't get in my head. Yeah. I, I've had a developer say, hey, you know, draw this up. Oh, just get now, now draw this, you know, do something different, right? Or I've had a developer say something, and then like his guy that works in the office is like, no, we're not doing that. You know, like he doesn't know what he's talking about. We're actually doing this, right? So it's very common. To me, it was very easy, like, oh, just tell them no. Like, there's a mistake. That <laughs> that isn't gonna happen. But there's this different rules. There's this different mindset mindset between you know an agent and what they're selling and the buyer. Their whole and, their whole thing is a contract, right? Mm. Their their whole thing world, is a contract. Their whole world. Yeah, their whole world, their whole psyche. They just can't get out of that mode. And for us, we're like, yeah, but that was verbal. And they're like, well, then there's this clause about verbal and blah blah blah. And you know, so yeah, Alex struggled with that a little bit. It was from afar. It was I giggled a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> But, and then also at the time when we were doing it, we didn't have the extra money. We only had so much money. And that's why we were self-performing stuff. So all these little things adding up were, it, it was a little bit stressful. So end of the day, end of the day, what did you guys end up grossing on the project after you count all the sales? Do you want, do you got it? Uh, do you have the total number though? I, I Well, everything came out to about around 3.1 million. And that's not counting. Um, but that's all he wants is gross, right? Yep. Enoch. Yeah. So yeah. So the gross on this was. Let me do the math real quick. Was about. Whoops. Was about 700k. 
And then you got to pay. That, a bunch that of would people. be the net. That would be the net. So after real estate fees, after paying off the loan. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the gross is one three point one. The loan yep. was two point four. And yep. so then the net. Uh, I thought you meant gross profit, but then there's sort of this net net, right? Because sure. out of the seven hundred k, we got to pay the realtors, we got to pay all these title companies, we got to pay. If there's any overages where we just oh, had to cover it. Yep. Um, insurance, uh, warranties. You know. Yep. Things tend to stack up. And so at the end of the day, so after we take out those expenses, what's the net net? The net net for us was about a quarter million. About uh, k That came back. That came back to F9, and then it got split in a couple, a bunch of different ways, obviously. And one of the things too, I think that everybody, if they're ever going to do this, is they should. You should be putting for each sale. You should be putting away three to percent of that sale. Forget about it. And put that into into it into an account that you can draw from throughout the year because you have a warranty period. Stuff is going to happen. People are going to make. <laughs> there's going to be. Who knows what'll happen? A pipe could burst. Whatever. You got to figure it out. Um, and you can't just. You can't. You can't not have any money to take care of these people for one year to make that happen. And I want to reiterate how big of a epiphany that was for us because we've known. This actually came from a developer that we've worked with for ten years, and he's never done that. Until last year, he hired a guy who said, oh, I, we used to build hundreds and hundreds of homes, and we always put away 3%. It's, it never goes into our pocket. So now when these issues come up, it isn't like it's taking out a lance in the eye's pockets or other people's pockets. No, that's part of the pot that's to be expected. It, even though we didn't have to go through the pain of learning that, I'm very happy. Like I, I can still appreciate how much that small bit of wisdom helped us out. Beautiful. So at the end of the day, how did this go for you? I mean, did you feel like you made out like bandits or do you feel like, oh, it wasn't after you, all the work we put into it and if we'd actually gotten paid, we were earning, you know, 15 bucks an hour. What's what's the takeaway for you guys? The, the takeaway is uh, some of, we actually talked to a couple people that were maybe going to give us a couple hundred thousand to make it work, right? To make it the hybrid work. And they said it's too thin. Um. And one, one even said, if I knew actually how thin it was, we met with him later. I would have told you not to do it. I would have told you not to do it. And I think we almost came to his perspective. Like if someone showed this to us again, we'd say it's too thin, don't do it. But we already did do it. <laughs> so the net positives for us are to be able to come in and, and have clients, you know, talk about architecture projects and then be able to say, oh yeah, you're actually in the space that we built. So, you know, Essentially, we know what we're talking about. And we couldn't have made that amount of money. We did make a, a good amount of money. You know, we essentially 3x, you know, individually, you know, our money that's over a, three years. Yeah, so. I think that's critical to say that, like, you could get a return of 300%. That's hard. That's really hard to do. Yep. So, so that's good. It was, so if we didn't do it, I, I can just see my bank account and I can see, okay, I, I would have you know, not spend all that money on engineers and stuff. And I would have had that, but I wouldn't have had what I had now. But the risk, again, if this recession would have happened earlier, if this would have taken us longer, I almost would say, man, this maybe wasn't worth it based on just that risk factor. But we did, yeah. we did it. <laughs> we already did it. So it's already done. Uh -oh. That was amazing. And now did I, did I hear you guys correctly? You're in one of the spaces right now? Yeah, we are sitting on our, Alex and I are recording this with you from our mezzanine, um, which is, we have a three-story basically office condominium now. The first floor is our shop, and that's where our construction arm lives right now. All of our tools are down there, extra supplies. It's actually really nice now for like staging um, materials before they get, procuring them before they get to our other job sites because like you can, you can help people save money with uh, like doors. I just ordered interior doors. We saved the client, I think 600 bucks. Um, stuff like that matters, right? And then, yeah, we're on the mezzanine, and then the upper floor is our architecture firm. And so that's to to you know to bring it back to Alex saying that there's this you know the positive about it is people walk up, man. It's it's pretty incredible. Now they're just we say, oh yeah, we know we were the developers for this. The amount of confidence it gives them from us, from a architect builder, and if we ever partnered again to do the development, I think is huge. It just kind of helped us level up again. Maybe we wouldn't have done that for another 10 years or something like that. Like how long does it take? Alex and I are mid 30s, so how long does that really take for you kind of have that kind of clout trust from people just from walking through your building?
And then this building right now, because the bank would only loan us 75%, we have 25% equity in, in this building too. So hopefully that also yeah. continues, which we didn't count. Yeah, so actually my number, exactly, and I forgot about that. That's where our the number actually gets to, I think. Um, so if we put in, if we put in, let's say 120K, basically it was a 300% return if you if you count the equity that's now in our building too. So it's nice, right? I mean, everybody, real estate never goes away, right? Uh, you could buy stocks, you could vaporize, you could buy gold, it could completely crash, who knows? But real estate never goes away. And especially where we live, the city is landlocked. It's like Boulder, uh, Boulder-ish. It's like Portland and all that same sort of thing. Like supply and demand, There's they're not building any more of these office buildings. So when you culminate the whole thing like that and understand that, yes, there was cash flow that came back. Yes, an extra bonus for our employees. They learned a ton on site. We got this new relationship with all these contractors that we can trust now. And, and, and we launched another arm out of it, plus the building and the equity in that that we can draw on if we ever needed to refinance or anything like that, if we had gotten to a pinch or something, or, or we just keep it, you know, for hopefully for 25 years and then we sell it and retire. I don't know. All of that together, it does make it worth it. Worth it. But I think Alex and I have to continue to have these conversations to convince us that. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. So I didn't realize, so this thing was, it was a mixed use project. I mean, was there any zoning challenges about getting that done? Because you're saying oh. it was residential, but then you guys also have a commercial component to it. Was that yeah, a hassle? Yeah. And I, so the way we split up the project too is Alex did all the planning and zoning work. And then I did all of the construction docs and managing that part. So I would, he should speak about the challenges there. Yeah. So we got pretty far in the planning and zoning before they let us know, probably eight to 10 months into it, which means a lot of work. You played a lot, almost all of your civil engineers by then. Um, and essentially they said, oh, this building that we're sitting in needs to be 15 more feet away from where it is. So it would have essentially just destroyed that whole building and it was upsetting because i wish i would have known that a year ago uh instead of right now so i said essentially had to go present at the planning and boarding uh committee and we we, we did one small thing where we essentially met, put more plants on that side but w why we called it mark ii is that we learned from other developers so from the beginning we planned this to be a, a benefit to the city and not just hey because we're building something it's a it's a benefit to the city so i was able to talk about we have staggered buildings and how that relates to um basically the building on the other side how it's a condo project and, and they don't have it how they how we have sky uh sky decks basically up yard so that gives um a benefit to, to the owners and it actually makes us have more land space because those are our usable space right there but they had to vote and they had to vote a year into it and 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 you know probably close to a hundred thousand dollars i bet you we put more than 120 in to be honest but <laughs> hundred thousand dollars in and who knows we could have pissed someone off they could just say no they could just be strictly by the book and it all would have that would have went that would have went away um, so that was one of the challenges, but, but we got through, through, you know, the other challenge, again, it came down to time. I just can't stress that enough is that, uh, there was this inclusionary housing ordinance. And if you, if anybody listening doesn't know what that is, just Google, uh, San Diego inclusionary housing ordinance. They probably have the most articles about it. They're terrible. Uh, I, just for the record, I think Alex thinks they are too, but the idea was it was going to be, it's another tax. It's another fee that you got to pay. And so here i think for each unit or something like if you build a single family home to put it in perspective now twenty thousand dollar tax on top boom i mean what does that cut out of your budget maybe it makes your project infeasible i don't know but our project was in the pipeline already in planning and zoning and we had to go to city council we had to bring our firm there alex spoke i spoke my wife spoke I, it was actually interesting because at our city council for two two sessions out of the year they'll do a back and forth. Usually it's public invited to be heard, three minutes, go up, speak, you're done. But this one was real interesting because you can talk back and forth with them. And I took up most of the time. <laughs> All the other citizens were pissed, but it was like a half hour discussion with them about if you guys do this, you're killing our project. You're killing our project, you're killing all these jobs. And they allowed our project we convinced them basically, us and another enough developers that if you're already in the pipeline, we don't have a line item budget for this, you'll kill it. So you need to let the people in the pipeline get through 
and set a date for to make it fair. It can't be like a just draconian law because that's what it would have been. It was to make it fair is anybody once you pass the law, then anybody after that should be subject to this. And it's very critical because we wouldn't have thought this because it doesn't make sense, is that if you're doing a project that's substantial, you have to listen and watch every city council meeting because they were going to make a law and they were gonna make it retroactive, which would have, it, it, it would have killed our projects. How can we budget for something that we can't see? And in, their, in half of the people's mind on city council, this was an okay thing to do, to make a law retroactive dealing with money. They thought that this was totally fine. So we we went and we got all the other developers up there too. And then we actually not only railed on them because of that, but then on the process and said why this is such a big deal and why we've been in there so long. And one of the planners is who's actually one of our friends now, the, the mayor called him up and said, What do you say to this? And and he got up and he said, He goes, actually it's it's good to hear this. We don't <laughs> we don't have this feedback because Lance and I were um, I was vicious when I went up. I I, 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 I complained about um, two big things. And one was like, why do we care about fonts? Because Alex's big thing is like, why do we care about why do we care about fonts that don't affect the building? Like the fonts don't affect the product. They don't affect the safety. None of the things that the all the planners are supposed to be involved with the, the you know, the goodness of the building or anything like that. And then line weights it's like, guys. We know how to build it. We know how to design it. This is not what we should care about. And uh, and then yeah, we got that and response. We had builders come up to us. I know me. I um, I almost I know you too. And said, I can't believe you said all that. Like thanks thanks for saying all oh, that. Oh yeah. And what was crazy is that our project got through and we kind of stopped paying attention as much. But then I get another project in this town, a couple other projects, and I go to planning again and I say because I know that we're going to have to go through site plan review. So I go there to clarify it and just say, hey, what forms do I need to fill out? And they go, oh, no, you don't need to for this project. So, like, not only did they, to give them credit, like, they went back and reevaluated. Because if you did anything over 10% on a residential house, you'd have to go through site plan review, which means it's uh, delayed for six months easily. We're demolishing a house and rebuilding it. And they're like, oh, no, you're good. Just go straight to building permit. Like, this is amazing. <laughs> yep. Amazing. Well, guys, I mean, fantastic interview. Thank you for sharing so much behind the scenes of what it took to do that project, lessons learned. I mean, what an amazing story. And now you're walking away with this extra experience and what a great foundation for the rest of, of your career. Where do you go from here? What are you guys excited about? I think we're excited about taking a mental and almost a physical restart. It's been almost 10 years to the day, almost. Really? Mm -hmm. um, and it lined up with another, you know, we can quote unquote recession. And I think it's reinvigorated us to to grind on a on the same foundation, but make that foundation even better and even stronger. Um, so there's a bunch of things that, that we're going to do um, to shamelessly give ourselves a plug. We don't even know them all, but if you listen to Inside the Firm podcast, we'll probably be talking about them. Um, so just like I think you're on the same boat is that it it's a great reset point and people should take that positively. Lance, you have anything to add to that? Just strengthen your roots. Strengthen your roots. Always know just dig deep in at this point in time. If you're if we are really heading into a recession and, and things are looking a little bit bleak, think about all of the strengths that you have that you are that are untapped and see how you can bring those out into the fold, offer them as a service, uh, better yourself. I try, I, th I remember what it was like to start the firm in the Great Recession, and it was terrifying and exciting at the same time. And I'm sitting here today, and I, I feel that same way. I was speaking with Earl Parson, uh, who is one of my architecture friends, this morning on Facebook. And I said, how are you feeling today, buddy? And he goes, he goes, I'm terrified. And he goes, how about you? And I go, I'm terrified and I'm excited at the same time. And I think that's a, that's actually a good place to be because it just motivates you to really get things going uh, up to up to the kind of speed that you should be at. It keeps you nimble. It keeps you hungry. You know, one of the most one of the best things I've ever heard, like statements that I like about entrepreneurs is every day you break up broke. Every day, just you put it in your mindset that you are waking up broke and hungry and get up there and grind. Love it. Lance and Lance Psycho and Alex Gore, thank you for joining us today on the Business of Architecture. Thank you. It was great being with you. Thanks for having us on again. And that's a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practices. 
the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture because you see it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back it's the complexity of running a business managing projects and people dealing with clients contractors and money so if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven simple and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.